Today's back. I'm really thrilled to see um, some, some new faces and some old faces. <laughs> and a really good amount of people here today to come together to hear Dr. Nelson Ting, um, uh, uh, who is from the University of Oregon. And um, I'll, I'll share the story when I first met Nelson. So I, um, I was supposed to be on this NSF-funded uh, East Asia and Pacific Summer Institute for graduate students. And any graduate student who's in this room who's interested in working in Asia, NSF has this amazing program um, where they do these mentorship programs where you go for two months to all these choose different countries in East Asia, like including Australia and Japan, Korea and China. So Nelson and I were on the second version happening in China. And my flight was canceled, so I came in a day later. And I got there, and I didn't know anybody. And everybody had already clearly socially bonded the night before, but I missed out on all of it. And I sat down, and I just so happened to sit next to Nelson. And he's like, so, are you an anthropologist? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have uh, been friends for a long time, ever since that um, grad student moment in Beijing years and years ago. Uh, sorry, Susan's in. So keep these grad student connections in mind. Yeah. They can last a lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, they can. And I also just, I don't know, there's, a, I also wanted to like publicly mention the EPC program because um, I feel like a lot of people don't know about it, and it's really, really kind of amazing. Um, and so Nelson was at the University of Iowa, and then he went on to the University of Oregon, where you've been for 10? Long, yeah, since 2011. Since 2011, yeah, it's even longer than that. Um, and he works um, primarily, well, originally he worked um, with, with primates, but he also does work um, now with other um, non-primate species. Um, and today he's going to talk about primate extinction in the Anthropocene. So please join me in welcoming Nelson to Thank you, Abby, for the introduction and stroll through memory lane. Um, okay, so, um, uh oh, this isn't advancing. Okay. Uh, like Abby mentioned, um, or, you know, in terms of me asking if she was an anthropologist, uh, clearly I was pursuing my degree in anthropology as well at that time period. So I was trained in biological anthropology, and I work at the intersections of primatology, conservation, and genetics with a focus on the forested regions of the African tropics. And I've worked, uh, I've had the fortunate, um, been in a fortunate position to work on a variety of systems, uh, including, uh, like Abby said, some even outside of primates now, uh, in particular uh, forest elephants. But looking at various aspects of uh, primate behavior in ecology or host microbe relationships, uh, hybridization, uh, so all these different questions I've addressed in a variety of systems. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to uh, answer questions about that later on. But what I really want to focus today is my work on these animals here that you see on your uh, lower left. So these are red colobus monkeys. So these are the monkeys that I've been working on for the longest. So just an introduction to um, red colobus monkeys. They belong to the subfamily colobinae. And they are leaf-eating monkeys and are arboreal. And they are heavily reliant on a forested environment. There are 18 different forms that you find across Africa. Well, they want to call these species or subspecies. That's been a debate in the past. But regardless, they are distinct from one another. Aside from this kind of hybrid zone in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, they're all rather distinct from one another in aspects of geographic range, vocalizations, and other parts of their biology. All 18 forms are uh, threatened with extinction and most of them are either endangered or critically endangered. So this makes them one of the most endangered primate groups, certainly in Africa and probably across the world as well. So what I want to do uh, today is tell you a bit of a story regarding these animals and how the story has led us to some conclusions regarding how these monkeys could be important for the conservation of tropical forests in Africa. Uh, after I wrap up this story, I'll highlight some of the conservation actions that I have been involved with as uh, a lot of my activities or my time towards activities have moved from basic science research and more into mission-oriented conservation action. Uh, also note that parts of this uh, talk, at least the data parts, are not published yet. Uh, we started this, uh, this project a little bit before the pandemic. The pandemic obviously delayed things quite a bit. Afterwards, we decided to add more data. Uh, but the results, they're finalized. I don't expect them to change. We're, we're writing this up um, in the coming months. 
OK. So I thought I would do some nonlinear uh, storytelling uh, and start towards the end of the narrative here. So this is a perspective piece that was published in Conservation Letters just this past month. And it was led by my colleagues Josh Linder, Drew Cronin, and myself, and involved an extensive group of, co of collaborators from different conservation spaces. So I think we're at a point where it's pretty clear that the conservation of tropical forests um, is intimately connected to a wide range of global agendas. So everything from mitigating biodiversity loss to maintenance of ecosystem services, including mitigating the adverse effects of climate change, uh, to ensuring food security and human livelihoods, and then also strengthening global health security. But the conservation of these forests faces major challenges as an intersection of global and local forces continue to drive their decline. So in this perspective piece, we argue that red colobus monkeys can play a crucial role in the conservation of these forests. And in particular, they can act as sentinels of forest health, with red colobus population declines often forewarning a decline in other species and or increase in forest degradation. And this is because we have found over the years that they are sensitive to various human activities, and they're often the first animals to disappear as certain activities like hunting and deforestation start to increase. So we argue that protection of red colobus monkeys can lead to positive forest conservation outcomes. So that's the end point of the story. And now I want to go to the beginning of the story and tell you about one line of evidence that led us to this conclusion. And that is the story of Miss Waldron's red colobus. So um, this is the most endangered primate in the world. So I know you'll, you'll hear in documentaries or you'll hear other people talk about some primates that are very endangered or they're really, really endangered, the most endangered. This is, I swear to you, the most endangered primate. So uh, it's been extirpated uh, across its range and it has not been seen alive by scientists in nearly 50 years. So um, part of the story is whether this thing is even uh, around anymore, uh, which we'll get to. Okay. The story starts in 1933 when Willoughby P. Lowe, a collector for the British Museum, collects several male and female specimens of a colobus monkey in the Gowasso Forest in Ghana. So just to orient you here, uh, this is the historical range of Mr. Walden's red colobus outlined in the red. Uh, the dots are kind of different forest localities that have been documented uh, to have this monkey uh, in the, um, there, present, uh, in the literature. And then this orange spot is this Gowasso Forest that I just mentioned. Uh, so, with Lowe was a traveling companion named Fanny Waldron. Not much is known about Fanny Waldron, uh, but based on historical records, it's possible she at least partially funded this collection trip. And certainly Lowe has written about her and said that you know, this collection trip would not have been possible without her support and without her uh, help and interest. So uh, that was in 1933. In 1936, three years later, Robert William Heyman describes these colobus monkey specimens and names them to a distinct taxon after Fanny Waldron. The common name of these monkeys becomes Miss Waldron's red colobus. Sightings of this animal continue into the 50s uh, across Ghana and Ivory Coast. There's some mention of conservation concern, but for the most part, it is noted that uh, it's still relatively abundant, still pretty common. And in the 1970s, it was still around, and someone even attempted to start a long-term research program studying this animal at Bia National Park, which is right here. So that was in the 1970s. So uh, there's a bit of a hiatus in the story uh, until the 1990s, where there are substantial surveys, wildlife surveys, done in various forests across Ms. Waldron's range. Uh, and they covered about 19 different forests, and they failed to detect any remaining signs of Miss Walden's red colobus. This led to them in the year 2000 to, uh, to publish this paper that declared the extinction of this monkey. So 1978 actually becomes the last sighting recorded of this animal alive by a scientist. We have museum skins, we have museum specimens, we have uh, skeletal remains in museums. We actually don't have any photographic evidence of this animal, so I'm limited to showing you uh, these illustrations uh, reconstructed based on those museum specimens. Um, so this is big news. So despite how endangered you hear many primates are, no primates have actually been declared extinct uh, except for this animal. Uh, and that remains to be true to this day. Uh, so it's the only modern, pri modern primate taxon that have been declared extinct. So one year later, uh, Scott McGraw at Ohio State University, who was part of the original survey team um, who surveyed those forests, uh, returned to Ivory Coast. And this is actually a great part of the story to hear Scott McGraw tell it. Uh, he returned to the forests with a crew from National Geographic. 
and the crew is there to document him searching hopelessly in vain for this extinct monkey. Uh, so one of the first things that happens is he comes across a hunter and he asks the hunter, have you seen this animal? And the hunter's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I shot this animal or one of these animals just a few months ago. Here's this tail. So uh, the Nat Geo documentary did not go as planned, um, needless to say. But this isn't necessarily surprising. Uh, the forest where the hunter says he got the tail from and shot this monkey is this Tano forest in the, on the border of Ivory Coast and Ghana right there. And it's got an extensive swampy region that's very inaccessible. So it's possible that there is a uh, very cryptic remaining small population of Miss Waldron's red colobus in this forest. Uh, so this is the tricky thing. It's really hard to prove something extinct. So once something dwindles in population size, they become very cryptic, they become very hard to find, they only go to the most inaccessible parts uh, of the ecosystems. So uh, it's really hard to prove that, that they, they're no longer there. Okay, one thing that had to be done, however, was to verify that this tail actually did belong to this animal. Uh, and this is where I jump into the story. And at the time, I was a graduate student doing a dissertation project on um, the molecular phylogenetics of red colobus monkeys across Africa, in part to identify distinct genetic lineages and to designate conservation priorities. So uh, I received this tail specimen. Um, I sequenced uh, a few thousand base pairs of mitochondrial DNA from it, and I put it into this uh, phylogenetic tree. So you can see it up here, uh, uh, Waldroni, in this uh, uh, clade labeled A. And it does group with the other red colobus monkeys into this clade. So that's verification that it actually did belong to the red colobus group. And then that's the only red colobus in that forest. So it is indeed Miss Waldron's red colobus. And so we awkwardly had to walk back the declaration of extinction of Miss Waldron's red colobus because it's possible that it's still around. Um, following this uh, in 2008, not much work was done on this animal. Uh, people thought it was just kind of, okay, maybe it's still there, but you know, it's a kind of hopeless cause. Uh, it's likely going to go extinct regardless. Um, it's not viable. So uh, people would talk about, oh, there were some vocalizations heard every now and then, but nothing really that could be verified. Then in 2017, a fledgling conservation NGO called Global Wildlife Conservation, which is now known as Rewild, launched a campaign called the, Lert the Search for Lost Species. And they had their top 25 lost species that they were trying to find. And among them was Miss Walden's red colobus, which is right here. So uh, Global Wildlife Conservation, now Rewild, they s invested a substantial amount of time and money into trying to find this animal. Uh, so they deployed extensive foot surveys in this forest, in the Tano Forest, where uh, the tail specimen was found. And um, you know they were trying to visually record evidence of this animal, or maybe even uh, detect vocalizations from this animal, but those came up empty. They also deployed camera trap surveys in the forest. So uh, these are camera trap surveys. These camera traps were kind of deployed or set up really high up in the canopy, which is where you would expect to find these animals. So this is a picture of someone setting up a camera trap and taking a picture down. So you can see they're pretty high up there. Um, so I was not involved. I did not lead this work at all. I was involved tangentially as um, as giving advice and feedback as uh, we were receiving results. But there were about a dozen camera traps put in the, up in the forest. They'd be up there for a few months. Then they'd kind of take the camera traps down and rotate them to different parts of the forest every few months. And they actually got them to some pretty, to some pretty inaccessible parts of the forest. So, um, however, I was very skeptical this would work. Because at the time, uh, this is back in 2018-19, uh, camera trap surveys, and to this day, they still are really much more commonly used in terrestrial animals. Uh, not many people are putting them high up in the trees. So I didn't really think this would work. But you actually get some pretty cool images from these camera traps. So this is the first ever video of a Rollaway monkey. So this is an endangered primate. It's critically endangered. There are only about 2,000 of these left, and this is one of the only forests in which it's found, maybe this one and another one. So this is not an animal you could easily detect. It's not an animal you'd normally see, uh, but it shows up in these camera traps. This is another very rare animal. This is uh, the white-thighed black and white colobus monkey. Uh, my colleagues and I have actually done quite a bit of work on this animal uh, right across the border in Ghana at a place called Boabang Fima Monkey Sanctuary. Uh, so we've done some behavioral ecology work on there over the decade, the past decade or so. Uh, but 
Critically endangered, very rare, hard to find. It shows up in these camera traps. So what you're going to see here is an olive colobus monkey. And this is an extremely rare behavior. So uh, olive, colobus, olive colobus mothers carry their infants in their mouths. So to my knowledge, no other monkeys or apes do this. This has been recorded in the field before, so we've known this for a couple of decades at, at least. But this is the first ever video evidence um, or recording of this behavior in an olive colobus monkey. So you can see it there. The mother's carrying the infant in its mouth. So there you go. So uh, what this shows you is these camera, tracks, these camera traps do work in detecting uh, rare animals and also rare behaviors. And they actually detected every single monkey known to exist in that forest except for Ms. Rolgen's red colobus. All right? There have also been now environmental DNA surveys in this forest. So this is a method where uh, it's known as eDNA, where you're looking for trace DNA evidence uh, of wildlife in the water, but the bodies of water and the waterways in, the, in, um, in this forest. So uh, the idea is that things on the land, even up in the trees, they are shedding DNA into the environment, and that DNA is washing away in, into the water. Um, so I was also, again, skeptical that that would work, that you would find evidence of terrestrial animals, uh, or good evidence of terrestrial animals in these waterways using this method. But um, the results show that every single monkey in the forest is detected in eDNA surveys, except for Ms. Waldron's red colobus. So now there's talk of sending in thermal imaging drones into this forest, which is another new method for uh, censusing animals. Uh, I don't know. I don't know at what point this gets a little bit out of hand in terms of money you're investing looking for this animal. We do want to make sure that it's not there if we're going to declare it extinct because we don't want to walk that statement back again. But again, it is hard to know whether something is extinct or not. And again, like I, I said, I admit, to be fair, uh, I was skeptical of some of these technologies, but they seem to be actually working pretty well in detecting rare animals um, and rare behaviors. But in my opinion, uh, this animal's extinct. I mean, uh, you know, maybe I'll have egg on my face in a year and you'll hear some new story about you know, some individuals are remaining or have been found, but it really is looking like this animal is not there and it's gone. So uh, that leads to this big question, why did it go extinct? Or in general, why do species go extinct? So this is important to think about. Uh, humans are connected to the health of these ecosystems. The health of these ecosystems is connected to the wildlife that is present. So if we want to understand uh, how to maintain ecosystem integrity, we have to have an understanding of this issue, of why these species go extinct. And the theoretical framework that emerged when conservation biology was a nascent scientific discipline is the idea of the extinction vortex. So according to this idea, species go extinct due to small population size. So a variety of, fract of factors can drive a species to small population size. But once it gets small, that is why it goes extinct. It gets sucked into this vortex. So a small population size leads to increased inbreeding. It leads to a loss of genetic diversity via genetic drift. Those lead to a loss of adaptive potential. Uh, lead to a loss of um, rates of survival. These lead to smaller population size. And then uh, the population gets, uh, goes through this cycle again and again and again until it dwindles and just disappears. So this is a deterministic model, uh, and it's theoretically sound. But it's not totally clear if this is actually a process that happens, especially nowadays where humans have an increasing footprint on the Earth's ecosystems. These ecosystems are changing at a rate that is kind of really unprecedented. So do species actually enter this extinction vortex, especially species like primates, which are larger bodied, have longer generation times, and so forth? Or uh, do they actually just jump this vortex and go straight to extinction? So that is an open question. Um, and we can actually test this idea in terms of recent extinction. Like I said, it's hard to test because we there have been no primates to be, have been declared extinct except for this animal. And we can test this by looking at the genome of Ms. Waldron's red colobus from that tail sample to see if there are signatures of the extinction vortex. So if this were to be the case, then you would expect to, in that genome to find uh, evidence of loss of genetic diversity, low genetic diversity. You'd expect to find uh, signs of inbreeding. You'd expect to find signs of high mutational load, so an accumulation of deleterious mutations. Um, so these are all evidence of what we would refer to as genomic meltdown or genomic erosion. Um, so and testing this idea is not only kind of uh, important to kind of uh, elucidate the story of Mr. Walden's red colobus, but it does have also broader implications for conservation policy, which I will get to. So uh, the first thing you need to do in order to do this, though, uh, is have a good 
reference genome for red colobus monkeys. And this is something that did not exist, and we had to build uh, a de novo assembly of a reference genome. The problem is you need really high quality materials to do this in terms of biomaterials and samples. And most of the reference genomes, the prime reference genomes that you see that are publicly available, they are actually uh, from captive animals or cell lines. Uh, unfortunately, there are no captive individuals of red colobus monkeys. They're too rare. There are no captive indiv individuals that exist in the world. But we did have blood samples from a project that I worked on about 10 years ago at Kabbalah National Park in Uganda. So this is um, across the continent, but still a closely related animal, the Ugandan red colobus monkey, or the ashy red colobus monkey, also known as. So this was a project that was co-led by myself, Tony Goldberg at Wisconsin, Colin Chapman, who at the time was at McGill. Uh, there were some others involved, Jamie Jones at Stanford, Bill Switzer at CDC. But uh, we were funded by the NIH to basically look at disease transmission among red colobus monkeys, and then factors that might cause these diseases to jump into um, human populations. So we published a series of papers on this. Um, this is just some of them. And I'm happy, this is a bit of a tangent, I'm happy to talk about this um, if you have questions about it. But we documented uh, different infectious agents that exist in these red colobus monkeys from these blood samples and from other samples that we collected. Uh, we looked at immunogenic factors that pattern susceptibility to uh, these infections. We also um, looked at how evolution shapes those genetic factors in terms of susceptibility. And then uh, we looked uh, at, you know, intersecting these lines of evidence uh, to kind of show how, you know, potentially these uh, agents can be jumping into human populations. So this is all embedded in a One Health framework, uh, looking at aspects of global health or thinking about aspects of global health, thinking about aspects of disease sur and disease surveillance. Um, so that was great work. That was fun work. Uh, a bit of a tangent, like I said, but uh, allowed us to basically sequence this genome. Um, so we got these blood samples. Uh, we were able to uh, have not just DNA, but RNA samples uh, for uh, um, annotation of this genome. But, uh, you know, these are the details, but the, the short story basically is this is a high quality reference genome. It's one of the more complete ones that you can find online. And, um, uh, and it's from a wild primate, so that's kind of rare. Uh, so this was work that was led by myself, uh, my graduate student at the time, Noah Simons, uh, and then also uh, he was co-advised by Kirsten Sterner, and then Gita Eck was a research associate working in the Sterner lab at the time, so uh, the four of us uh, collectively uh, were able to put this together. So this was all done at U of O. Um, that was a fun project. Okay, so once we had our red colobus reference genome assembled, we could start thinking about Ms. Waldron's red colobus. Uh, this was work that was led by my postdoc at the time, Caitlin Wells, and is now being continued by my current graduate student, Savannah Bird. So we also requested access to historical specimens of Waldron's red colobus from the Natural History Museum London. That way we could look at not only what the genome looked like at the end in terms of the last known samples, but also how genomic integrity might have changed through time. So um, after sequencing some, uh, doing some preliminary analyses, we identified three historical specimens uh, from the Natural History Museum in London that could be used for and move forward um, for additional sequencing. So these were actually paratype specimens from Lowe's original expedition in 1933. Uh, there was also an additional skin sample that um, Scott McGraw had procured from a hunter around the same time as the tail, so that's from around 2000, 2001. Uh, so that gives us a sample size of five. So warning, small sample size, but it's an extinct monkey. Keep that in mind. So pretend I'm a paleontologist and a sample size of five is amazing. Um, and also note that we, these are the, the very first specimens known uh, to science from this animal and the very last one. So we really kind of maximized the temp temporal range that we're looking at in regard to um, what its genome looked like as it was extirpated um, throughout its range. So we kind of had standard uh, clean room procedures uh, for the methods. Uh, if you're interested, we, we did competitive mapping with the human genome to map out contamination. Uh, that all looked good. Uh, we analyzed uh, the genomes using this thing called the Genroad pipeline. So this is uh, a pipeline that packages a bunch of analyses together that, uh, to look for genomic erosion. And then after all this processing, uh, each sample ended up being sequenced to a minimum of 15x coverage. So uh, we have medium to high coverage genomes to analyze. Okay, so uh, some, some basic results to start with. We were able to fish out whole mitochondrial genomes from uh, the, the, um, uh, the sequence data, 
And we put that into the original data set that I collected when I was a graduate student to see what it would look like. And you can see here, here they all group together, the Waldron's red colobus uh, genomes. And then they group with the other Western red, red colobus um, samples here. So uh, that's expected. Um, they're, they're all West African. Uh, interestingly here, though, um, it's still, this, there's this really long branch length that leads to Waldron's red colobus, much longer than we would expect. So uh, this seems to suggest that it's a, a distinct genetic lineage. Um, like I said, it wasn't necessarily expected to be that distinct. But this is just mitochondrial DNA. Um, I think what we really need to do to kind of figure this out is to sequence genomes across uh, the red colobus range uh, to, look what, to see what the nuclear genome looks like. So that is future work that is kind of in progress. So uh, hopefully in a year or two, we'll have um, results on that. But at the very least, what this shows us is A, we do have authentic sequences of Ms. Wallinger's red colobus, and B, it's potentially, uh, it potentially represents a uh, distinct genetic lineage. Okay, so there are various ways to think about genetic diversity and report um, genetic diversity, but we use heterozygous sites per 1,000 base pairs. So we chose this one because a bunch of other studies that do similar work to this use that as a metric. And so we wanted to have a index that is comparable to other studies so we can um, do some comparative work. So you see here, uh, this is this index that is uh, ranked from highest to lowest uh, from the samples. And you can see the highest diversity sample and the lowest diversity sample are both from the modern samples. So the historical samples are interspersed in between. So this shows that there was no real decrease in genetic diversity over time as this thing was extirpated. Uh, and um, so there's no evidence of that type of genomic erosion. Uh, we just took a mean here uh, in terms of an average uh, genetic diversity or genome-wide diversity measure since we did not see that change. So the question is, is that high or low? This is a paper from 2017, and this plots census population size on the x-axis to this index heterozygous sites per 1,000 base pairs on the y-axis. And what you have here are um, a sample of birds and mammals. So if you look at Ms. Waldron's red colobus, it plots about here. I wasn't sure where to put it in terms of census population size. Like I said, we think it's extinct, so you could put it here at zero. Uh, even if you put it you know, at a larger population size, it's still an extreme outlier on this plot. So not only did it not change in genetic diversity through time, but it seemed to retain very high genetic diversity when it went extinct. Okay, to look for signatures of inbreeding in the genome, you can look at things called runs of homozygosity. So these are uh, tracts of the genome that don't have any variation, okay? Uh, and then you can have like 100,000 base pair tracks um, that indicate inbreeding, or you can have really long runs of homozygosity over two and a half me megabases that are indicative of very recent inbreeding. And what you have here are uh, runs of homozygosity genome fractions. So the percentage of the genome that is comprised of these runs. And you, here you have the three historical samples and then you have the two modern samples. So what you see here is interesting. You have actually an increase in inbreeding over time in Mr. Waldron's red colobus. And then not only that, but the very, very long tracks that are indicative of very recent inbreeding uh, are actually only found in the modern samples and not in the historical samples. So this is evidence of, okay, maybe there's something going on, on here with increased inbreeding. Then the question becomes, okay, when it went extinct, how do these levels of inbreeding compare to uh, other animals, other species? So this is a paper from Shu et al., 2015, in Science. And this focused on mountain gorillas, uh, or gorillas in general. This was about mountain gorillas, but they looked at other gorillas as well. Here you have um, the same kind of thing, runs of homozygosity genome fraction, but this is really focusing on those really long runs, uh, over two and a half megabases. So you have here uh, the Altai hominin, this is the Denisovan, and then you have the four different subspecies uh, of gorilla. Uh, I separated the modern and historical samples here, so uh, you have um, historical by, denoted by H, uh, modern denoted by M, so you don't have any of these runs in the historical samples. And I averaged the two uh, modern samples, so about between 1 and 2 percent uh, of the genome is comprised of these very long runs. And you can see uh, the levels of inbreeding in this animal are still very low compared to uh, these other uh, species here, or uh, taxa. And even the western lowland gorilla, 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 this is an animal, uh, you know, it's critically endangered, but it still has a relatively large range. There are about 300,000 of them left. 
Uh, and still, these are showing higher levels of inbreeding than Ms. Walden's red colobus when it went extinct. So even though, take home story here, is, uh, even though levels of inbreeding increased over time, they still remain relatively low compared to other threatened taxa. Uh, this is looking at mutational load. So um, a sign of genomic meltdown, like I said, is the accumulation of deleterious mutations as natural selection is unable to purge them from the population. Uh, you have three different classes of protein coding mutations here, silent, missense, and loss of function. And then here you have the his historical specimens average, the modern specimens average, and these are the percentage of these protein coding mutations that are comprised, or the, the, uh, each class, uh, what percentage of them uh, comprise all the mutations that are found in the protein coding regions compared to the reference genome. So if you sum these across the rows, they should equal 100. Um, and so I want to focus on the missense and loss of function mutations because those are the ones that are thought to be potentially deleterious. Uh, missense, uh, it could go either way. Loss of function is definitely thought these are deleterious. So you can see um, you have, you do not have an increase in change in missense or loss of function mutations over time. If anything, they're going down. Uh, so this could be evidence of purging by natural selection of deleterious mutations. Um, or, but at the very least, what you can say is they're not going up. You do not have this mutational meltdown, this accumulation of deleterious mutations in the genome as this thing is going extinct. So uh, what these results tell us overall, the, the big picture story, no loss in genetic diversity through time. Uh, no, you know, maybe an increase in inbreeding, but still low levels of inbreeding when it went extinct, and then also uh, no increase in, in genetic load or mutational load over time uh, as it went extinct. So um, it, this leads to evidence, or this is evidence that it did not enter this extinction vortex that I mentioned. And this has implications for uh, conservation policy. So uh, this idea of the extinction vortex is pretty heavily embedded in uh, the field of conservation biology, and it has shaped a lot of uh, proposed policy. So uh, just in recent years, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of advocacy for the incorporation of measures of genetic diversity into international conservation conventions. So this is just one of the papers that has been published over the past few years. And you can see uh, they really are recommending uh, reporting at the national level for these conventions of uh, measures of genetic diversity in, um, in various species that are in different countries and then measures the, to maintain this genetic diversity. And what the results here suggest is that at least for species like Ms. Walden's red colobus or similar species, maybe other monkeys and apes, maybe other animals with long generation time, uh, these types of reporting and these types uh, of measures, which really are, uh, could be labor intensive, could be expensive, and very inaccessible to many countries, uh, they could be very uninformative and maybe not um, contribute to the best ways of thinking about extinction risk uh, and trying to mitigate extinction. So, uh, so that's how this kind of connects to a bigger picture in terms of what, how we're thinking about conservation at an international level and conservation policy. Okay, so um, then the question becomes, if the extinction vortex did not drive Ms. Walden's red colobus uh, to disappear, then what exactly caused the extinction of this monkey? So we can point to some typical narratives. So one is habitat loss. So this is a time series, um, uh, these are time series maps of uh, GIS coverage uh, in Ghana from 2000, or 1975, 2000, 2013. So this is the exact time period and the exact location where this monkey was um, uh, when it went extinct. Purple is forest, yellow is agriculture, and green is uh, savanna or woodland. So you can see how much forest is lost over this time period, and also how much conversion into agriculture there is of the land. So uh, this definitely played a factor in the disappearance of this animal, there's no question. But it doesn't explain everything, because you still have substantial forest blocks in Ghana where you have other monkeys, but you don't have Ms. Walden's red colobus. So the question is, what else is going on here? And what we really believe ha is happening is hunting. So hunting is probably playing the bigger factor in regard to why this animal disappeared. And there's this really interesting paper that was published in 2004 in Nature, Bashirs et al., and they looked at uh, aspects of hunting and fish supply um, and wildlife decline in West Africa. And what they studied, they looked at longitudinal records in Ghana from 1970 to 1999. Again, the same exact place and time period where this animal disappeared. And what they found 
is that there's a correlation between hunting intensity on the land, a negative correlation, and per capita fish supply um, off, uh, that is being harvested offshore. And so what they find is that uh, when there are uh, very, I guess when there's very high hunting intensity, you have low fish supply, and when you have very high fish supply, you have low hunting intensity. So the implication here is that uh, humans are actually, um, you know, they're, they're harvesting uh, either uh, fish supply or, or wild meat on land. They are using that as a protein resource, and they're actually switching between these resources depending on resource availability, okay? In this same paper, uh, they show uh, this chart. This is annual marine harvest off the coast of West Africa through time, so starting at 1945. Uh, and what you're seeing is a, uh, well, what you're seeing is in the open circles, these are uh, marine harvests from West African nations. And the closed circles are marine harvests from European nations fishing in the same waters. So you're seeing a dramatic increase starting in the 40s um, of marine harvesting. And what you're seeing is also that European fishing vessels are there in the same frequency uh, through time, uh, for the most part, there's some variation there, but for the most part, they're fishing there just as much as West African nations. So the implications here are pretty clear that they point to. Uh, the implications are that European fishing vessels are fishing these waters uh, and contributing to unsustainable fish harvests, and that's driving people inland uh, to hunt terrestrial mammals. And this is the same exact time period that Mr. Waldron's red colobus monkey goes extinct. Okay, so this prizes with a model for how global forces and, uh, and factors can contribute to the local extirpation of wildlife in Africa. And this is not the only line of evidence that we're drawing from uh, to think about how red colobus monkeys are particularly vulnerable to hunting or habitat loss. You have Mr. Walden's red colobus, uh, which has disappeared. On Bioko Island, you have a national park, Pico Basile National Park. There are other monkeys there in this park. Red Pennant's red colobus monkey, gone, hunted out. Right across, the way, right across the way in the mainland, you have Ebo Forest in Cameroon. You have this animal, Prus's red colobus monkey. You have other endangered animals there, like chimpanzees, gorillas, the drill monkey. Prus's red colobus monkey, gone, hunted out. Similar stories in Eastern DRC, Democrat, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, Kisangani red colobus, the Foa's red colobus. A uh, combination of habitat fragmentation and hunting has wiped those animals out. Um, compared to other primates. Also in East Africa, Zanzibar red colobus, Zumbo red colobus, a uh, combination of habitat fragmentation uh, and hunting has uh, cleared these animals out of the smaller forests. And even at Kabali National Park, uh, in the national park they're doing really well, at least uh, where there are not uh, huge communities of chimpanzees, uh, which are also hunting them. But uh, around the edges of uh, Kabali National Park in the fragments, uh, where I've worked, over, we've noticed over the past 20 years, red colobus monkeys have, have red colobus monkeys have disappeared, even though the other monkeys are there. So, uh, just summarizing those points, Miss Waldron's red colobus was extirpated across its range with little evidence of having entered the extinction vortex. It was hunted out and hunted out relatively quickly. An intersection of global and local forces provide a mechanistic model for how this extinction happened. For primates, particularly monkeys and apes, and other uh, animals that have longer generation time, genomic diversity will not be predictive of extinction risk. So such animals will likely be extirpated prior to showing signs of genomic erosion, given their longer generation times, which has important implications for thinking about assessing extinction risk and how we shape conservation policy uh, for, like I said, things in particular like primates. And the totality of this evidence led us to this conclusion we drew in this paper. So uh, red colobus monkeys can be used as indicators or sentinels of forest health and function. They can forewarn impending defaunation and or forest de degradation. And they can thus inform on potential loss of things like food security and ecosystem services. So if you focus on other species, things like that get more kind of airplay, like chimpanzees or gorillas, um, by the time you notice their decline and by the time they're gone, it's likely going to be too late. Uh, so using something that's a little bit more sensitive uh, is going to give you a, bre a, a better kind of pulse on, uh, on what's going on in the forest as an early indicator. So investing in red colobus protection can, resting in red colobus protection can potentially aid in African forest tropical, uh, African tropical forest conservation. So that's how we got this conclusion. Okay. So in that perspective piece, we 
um, recommend a series of actions regarding red colobus monkeys that can help pro uh, provide benefits to African forest conservation at large. Uh, but these are really a summary of what we list and what we outline in this red colobus action plan, uh, Ayusin Red Colobus Action Plan that we published a few years ago. So uh, getting into this is getting more into conservation action. Uh, and just as a side note in regard to why I got involved in this, uh, I co-led this action plan. But uh, I started to become very concerned that the work I do in basic science research is never going to get translated to actual conservation action. So this was my effort to start thinking about bridging the knowing doing gap. So there's been a lot of literature about bridging the knowing doing gap. Uh, I'm happy to kind of share what I've learned uh, in that process. But uh, this was a first stab at kind of thinking about that and really kind of thinking about, OK, moving forward, uh, where do I want to be spending my time? What activities do I want to be doing? Um, and how can I think about uh, research more holistically in terms of making uh, an impact? So I'm happy to discuss the recommendations that we make in this action plan. But I want to highlight, uh, so yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about it if you have questions about it. But what I really want to do is highlight some of the actions that we have uh, taken, because um, we do think they're important. They're baby steps in regard to what needs to be done as a whole. But um, we feel like they're, they're good first steps to make. So for one, we formed a red colobus monkey working group under the IUCN primate specialist group. So these are the primary people involved. These are all people who have been involved for a long time in red colobus conservation or the conservation of the habitats in which um, they reside. And for a long time, we've all been working in silos. And the idea here is that if we work together, uh, maybe we can kind of be more effective in pushing certain agendas forward. So um, we work together to support one another, uh, collaborate when possible, submit grants together when possible, give advice to one another on projects, review one another's proposals. Uh, whatever we can do, like I said, to advance certain agendas. And note that this is really an intentional group of people coming from different job sectors. So you don't have just academics. You have people at NGOs. You have people from governmental organizations. You have people with different types of expertise. Uh, some people are mostly involved in research. Some people are, are involved in things like fundraising or PR uh, or crafting policy. So all these different perspectives are needed. Um, it's been a big learning process for me. Uh, there definitely have been butting of heads in terms of these perspectives. But uh, it, it has been really useful to kind of think about things from different angles and leverage each other's strengths um, to mitigate uh, weaknesses. So this is the group that was involved in that search for Ms. Waldron's red colobus in terms of the camera trap surveys and the eDNA surveys. Uh, and some other things we've been doing. Uh, one thing we've been doing is really trying to increase the funding for red colobus monkeys. So uh, we really had to lobby various foundations and organizations to prioritize red colobus conservation. Uh, and we've done this with you know, some level of success. We just recently got approval to uh, make colobus monkeys an AZA uh, safe species. So there's going to be now dedicated funds from AZA to, um, to fund red, uh, colobus monkey conservation in general. But uh, we used the action plan to leverage a lot, uh, a lot of that and a lot of the money we've raised uh, through these different foundations. Um, so we've raised over the years about one and a half million dollars uh, since we started kind of thinking about the action plan. That sounds like a decent amount of money, but it really isn't that much money given the time period and also compared to what, uh, what gets put into things like gorillas or apes or lemurs. Because uh, we really had to start at the bottom floor because no one really even knew what these animals are or heard, have heard of them. So uh, it's a little different. It's really a little easier to raise money for things that people um, already are, are familiar with. So another thing we've done is to try to do some targeted PR in terms of trying to get people to be aware of these animals. So for example, in the past two months, Leonardo DiCaprio has posted on Instagram about red colobus monkeys. Uh, so this is intentional. Uh, I don't know how this works. I have no idea if this is effective or not. This is not my area of expertise. This is not what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, but people say, uh, you know, this is a good way of doing it. Certainly, uh, he has more Instagram followers than me. Uh, so uh, you know, maybe, this, maybe this is effective. Um, but these are the types of things we're trying to push forward. Uh, if you look at the comments here, they're actually uh, quite funny. Uh, this one here says, how come you didn't get on the board with Rose when there was enough space for two people? Um, so you know, uh, I didn't really think about that. I didn't know uh, Jack may have survived the, the movie Titanic. Uh, if you look, actually start Googling this. I Googled this, and it's actually, there are a lot of deep dive Reddit threads about this uh, that you know, could Jack have survived. Anyway. Uh, I'm hoping that this person at least had to see the pictures of the monkeys and read um, what was in the captions here uh, before uh, that person posted that. So, you know, maybe this is effective. You know, we'll see. 
Um, other things we've done uh, to work together, uh, we've created two new protected areas for red colobus monkeys, one in the Niger Delta and one on Zanzibar Island. Uh, these were kind of, this was done with a lot of help from the Rainforest Trust and Rewild. So, um, and this is a good example of the kind of collaboration we're trying to do in cross-pollination. So, Kenya has actually some interesting um, governance structures for their conservation areas, these community conservancy areas. So uh, we had one of our working group mem members from Nigeria, Rachel Kema, fly over to Kenya to visit one of our other working group members uh, who works at the Tana River in Kenya, uh, Stan Kibai, to learn more about these conservancies and to look at these governance structures. So she brought that back to Nigeria and used that as a model to establish this protected area. Um, on Zanzibar Island, uh, there is this uh, coastal, uh, these are, there is coastal lands where uh, humans are not inhabiting and they're not arable because of the salinity, but there are monkeys there. So um, that is now a protected area that has been created, a forest reserve, uh, and they're involving the local community, so they're involved in monitoring and protection of these monkeys, and that is going to be built up as an ecotourism site to bring in benefits to the local community uh, as they invest into this protected area. So, uh, you know, creating new protected areas, uh, getting kind of more buy-in from local communities, about protected areas, that has been one of the main goals, um, recommended actions from the action plan. We partnered with a nonprofit called the Forest Collective, uh, and this was to uh, build conservation education materials that can be used by teachers in communities that live adjacent to red colobus habitats. So these were designed to be embedded in the actual school curriculum by school teachers, and these teachers can then pick and choose different modules depending on what they felt were important um, in their own communities to convey uh, about ecosystem services, about biodiversity, about wildlife, and in general. So the artwork done in all of these, uh, it's really beautiful. Uh, these were all illustrations and artwork done by African artists coming from Red Colobus Range countries, and they've been translated into different languages like Swahili and French as well. As part of this conservation education kind of these efforts. Uh, I co-led a conservation education workshop at last year's International Conservation uh, Congress for Conservation Biology in Rwanda. So this was in partnership with some working group members as well as the Denver Zoo, North Carolina Zoo, the Forest Collective, and then this group of conservation educators, uh, these teachers, uh, well they, they train teachers. Um, this is based in Kabali National Park, uh, so I've known about this organization for a little bit based on my work there, and they actually are affiliated with the North Carolina Zoo, so we brought them in to share their knowledge as well. We also raised funding to fly in and have all their expenses paid uh, five teachers from different parts of uh, the Red Colobus Range across Africa. And so they participated in this conservation education workshop to kind of learn about different pedagogical approaches, to um, share with one another their experiences, to uh, share materials, to receive new materials from the Forest Collective, uh, and to kind of try to uh, think about uh, maintaining relationships with one another and with us so that they can kind of continue to um, broaden and improve their conservation education approaches uh, in their schools. So these are some pictures that these teachers uh, shared with us after uh, the workshop uh, and them implementing these materials in their own communities. So like I said, um, the hope is that they stay in touch. They're already kind of communicating over WhatsApp uh, with one another, uh, sending pictures to us as well. Um, and then the hope is that uh, they'll also kind of start doing assessment to kind of assess educational outcomes uh, in, these, in these communities. And for myself, like I said, I focus on genetics. Uh, I am still doing genetic work on red colobus monkeys. Uh, this is funding we received. This is being led by uh, my graduate student, Jenica McCarter, uh, trying to figure out what's going on in this hybrid zone in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo and seeing if we can designate conservation units there. Uh, and this work really, the, and this gets back to kind of thinking about, you know, basic science-related research versus um, more mission-oriented activities. Uh, the research here is of interest and it's important to me, don't get me wrong, but it's almost secondary. What we're really trying to do is to develop methods that are accessible, genetic methods that are accessible and easily in implementable in primate range countries. So uh, thinking about how can we um, stop taking samples out of these countries, how can we start collaborating with local scientists, scientists and local universities, uh, and how can we can start, um, how we can start training um, in these cases, either Congolese or uh, other African nationals in these methods uh, so that we can start strengthening and building uh, capacity so that they can do this work themselves. 
uh, running in parallel with this, uh, this doesn't have to do with red colobus monkeys, but this is along the same um, framework and along the same thinking. I partnered with the Dian Fossey Gorilla Fund in Rwanda uh, and the North Carolina Zoo. So the Fossey Fund, um, they just built recently this brand new research facility, or this campus they're calling it, it's a tourist and research facility. This is their base of operations outside of Volcanoes National Park where they're studying the mountain gorillas. And basically there's space here for a genetics lab, so I'm helping them set up this lab so that uh, they no longer have to send samples out to foreign collaborators to do their genetic work on the gorillas. Uh, so I will kind of set this lab up. I will lead the initial phases of it. I will help train Rwanda nationals. I'm taking on a Rwanda graduate student this fall. And then uh, the idea is that eventually, once these trainees are ready, uh, we'll hand over leadership of this lab uh, to them, to Rwandans, so that way we can kind of place these modes of knowledge production into the hands of local stakeholders. And then that way they can produce the knowledge that they feel like they need to manage their resources. So in terms of thinking about the future and thinking about how conservation works, uh, what the hope is that this can eventually lead to more equitable conservation outcomes. Okay, so uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, I do want to thank uh, a lot of people. So uh, these are various members of my lab group that, uh, you know, what I presented kind of uh, takes you from what I did as a grad student all the way through now. So there have been a lot of grad students I've worked with. I've been uh, postdocs, grad students, trainees that I've had the uh, fortunate um, circumstances to work with over the years. Uh, so I'd like to thank them. Uh, I'd also like to mention, you know, talking to Abby about where grad, grad students and trainees are these days, uh, I noticed about starting in 2016, 17, uh, slowly grad students, at least in my group, um, they were becoming more and more interested in, interested in non-academic positions. And uh, the pandemic really kicked that into overdrive. And then at this point, um, for whatever reason, uh, the majority of the people I work with in my lab uh, are interested in jobs outside of academia. So I have, I've had to really rethink the way uh, I conduct training. Um, and we fumbled through this a little bit, but uh, I think we're in a good place now. Uh, some of these people have moved on to academic jobs, but a lot of them are outside of academia, working in, in conservation. So I'm happy to share those experiences. Uh, I feel like we've been able to figure a lot out over the years. Um, in terms of funding and partners and sponsors, um, I have to thank these organizations, especially you know, thinking about everything from you know, sequencing the red colobus genome to uh, doing conservation education. Um, it's been uh, a lot of different agencies have funded different aspects of this work. Uh, there's been a lot of organizations involved in this, so especially the IUCN Primate Specialist Group, people like Russ Mitterbeier, uh, Bill Constant, um, leaders of the African Primatological Society have been good partners, uh, Inza Kone, Rachel Kema, um, all the working group members, and then these partners here, Forest Collective, North Carolina Zoo, and also Rewild have all uh, played big parts. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'd just like to thank them. Thank you for listening and I'll take questions.